Greetings LHB family. Today we're going to be discussing the subject of psychology in the church. Psychology has run rampant throughout the church and it's masked in so many different different theologies and philosophies but all in all it's been an encompassing thing that all of us have been prone to no matter who you are. We've all been I don't want to use the term victims of it, but we've all come face to face and have actually used many of the terminologies that come out of psychology. Let me first of all give a definition of psychology. Psychology is the study, that's the ology, of the soul, the suke. Well, there's a problem with that. It's actually totally an oxymoronic thing in Christianity. Let's turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 11 for just a second here. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse number 11. As I turn there for a second. 1 Corinthians 2 11 says uh, let's go to verse 10, by the way. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the Spirit of man, which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. So we can see that there's only one person that knows what's going on inside the person and that's the person himself see you know what's going on inside your mind I know what's going on inside my mind I could be looking at this camera right now and I could be addressing you but I could very well be thinking about the pot roast I'm gonna be having in an hour see I'm the only one that has access to my brain and likewise you. But even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. See, besides yourself, knowing what's going on in your mind, there's only one other person that knows you. And yes, that is the Spirit of God. The God's Holy Spirit knows exactly what you're going through, knows exactly what you need. So why do we spend, shell out thousands of dollars in, in books and, and going to therapists and counselors and uh, trying to find our way and our purpose in this world? Well, quite frankly, it, it is mostly selfishness. In my first part of this prophecy conference, I addressed the the issue that most Christians don't believe that they are totally complete in Christ. That's where psychology comes in because you feel short or you feel that you do not come up to the, the level of God. And by the way, you don't. And that's why we have the imputed righteousness of Christ Jesus that's been given to us. So no man knows what's inside of a person save for the Spirit of God. So psychology has made its inroads everywhere. You cannot go into a Christian bookstore, go online and get email or go on Facebook without confronting some sort of Christian Christian psychology. And the, the problem is that Christian psychology is no more Christian than Satanism is. I know that sounds harsh, but it's the reality. Christian psychology is indeed an oxymoron. Let's turn in our Bibles once again to 1 Timothy chapter number 6. And I, want, I just want to look at two verses here, verses 20 and 21. It says, Paul says to Timothy, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, Avoid profane and van bab vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. 
Grace be with thee. Amen. It's interesting. If we look at this just on its face value, you could see something happening here. He says right here in, in verse number 20, uh, he says, opposition of science falsely so called. I love the fact that our King James Bible says science. They take the word gnosis and translate it as science, where actually gnosis in its purest form and its literal meaning means knowledge, falsely so called. But what happens? I think of the King James translators, they made it, they made this perfect translation here of this particular word here because they were at a time at one of the highest levels of mysticism going on in the world. Who can remember things in the 14th and 15th and 16th century that were going on being called, called knowledge and science? People would go to the local witch doctor throughout the world, the local lord, even in, in Europe, to get all their knowledge and wisdom from. I can only think of when I was a uh, very old teenager slash young man. I can remember the, the uh, late night comedy show Saturday Night Live when it first started. And Steve Martin played a character called Theodoric of York. And he was the wise man that everybody in the region went to, much like a lord would be in, in, in Britannia. And people would go to him for every prescription, and he would, he would uh, assign uh, prescriptions of leeches and different things. And a lot of these things actually even came into early America as well. So Theodoric would, would prescribe ridiculous things. And I would prescribe to you that psychology to a Christian is a ridiculous thing. It was science falsely so called. See, as we've already seen in 1 Corinthians, is no man has access to, the, to your, your spirit. No man whatsoever except for you and except the spirit of God that is in you. That's it. So to say some philosophy or some sort of science can help you, it's, it's wrong. There may be things that might help in the immediate future, in the here and now, but ultimately the goal of Christianity isn't for the here and now. The goal of Christianity is to prepare to be with the Lord forever. And these things take our minds off of it. Let's look at again a, a word here and we can tie psychology with the NAR. We can, we can uh, apply psychology with the coming of the Antichrist as well. Let's look at this one word back in, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20. It says, to Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. That is the gospel. That is the word of God which Paul had given to him and trained him in avoiding profane and vain babblings. See, all these things, and I'm going to show a few things which are, which I would uh, call profane babblings and vain babblings. These from the founders of some of the psychology and psychiatry that we have today. It says, and oppositions of science, falsely so-called. The word oppositions there is a word that, that we can think of in regards to uh, Marxism, actually. Oppositions, that's antithesis. Thesis is a, a place, a firm place to stand, and anti is removing you from that firm position. That's a, a pretty simple way of explaining it. So the, the, the tenets of Marxism that around the, we call it the Hegelian, uh, di I can't, I can't talk, the Hegelian dialect, it's based on thesis, that's having a position, Antithesis, that's the opposite of that position, trying to take you from that position, and synthesis. So you have to have the two. You need to have 
conflict, the opposition or the, the position of the opposition, and then the synthesis, trying to merge those two things that, that are totally opposite each other together, or opposite to each other together. And that's what we have with psychology, merging two totally different worldviews together and synthesizing them as one. That's, that's the basic principle we have. We have, we see that happening in, like I said, the NAR, the New Apostolic Revival, or Restoration rather, or Reformation, either way, take it either way you want. You, you see it that way. You see it in government, Marxists opposing capitalists, and in the middle, they're merging together. So we see that also in psychology. Let's look at a couple of different uh, leaders in the psychiatry and psychological movement, and we'll see how it blends together in the church today. I want to look for a moment at uh, Sigmund Freud. Now, I don't want to go into details about, about Freud and, and his pernicious ways. To put it mildly, Sigmund Freud was a sick, twisted, sinful individual who tried, and he did it successfully, to take his sins and call them sicknesses and diseases, and they still stand today. His model, and I have it right here, was there were two ends. There were the... Uh, There was the conscience and unconscious. He, he used a, a, an iceberg type uh, picture of it that most of what we see in humanity is on the top of the iceberg, a very small portion of what, what man is really about. And so he taught the, the id, the superego, and the ego. And the, the, these all address different areas of of life, the id dealt with your mind, and and the superego dealt with morality, and I might have had them mixed up, but we'll look at how this this turns out together. But he believed in the id, in the the unconscious id. Most of your formative things were happening. These were these were sexual tendencies, which I'd rather call deviancies, according, according to Freud. So he built upon this. So because of that, he looked at dreams being one of the most important uh, purveyors of truth there are, or there is. Now we see the Bible is quite different. Dreams are not a pattern for people to follow. They happen. God did give dreams and visions to a select few people throughout the scriptures. And by the way, they never had to seek those things as people do today. And yes, I am tying this all together. Freud's sources of truth. I want to read this. Is It says, his genius was reflected in his integration of isolated, diverse, and often inconsistent sources. Stop right there. Aren't you glad that the Bible's consistent and we have the scriptures as that consistent truth, source of truth? But yet, many people will tap in to Freudian psychology and psychoanalysis. Foremost, he relied upon his self-analysis, primarily accomplished through dreams and free associations, implicitly recognizing that human psychic processes are universal. He also learned from the myths and legends of antiquity and the intuitive insights of the great writers, philosophers, and artists of different times, places, and cultures. Examples of Sophocles, Shakespeare, Goethe, Schopenheimer, Dvorsky, Dickens, Leonardo, and Michelangelo. These were all looked at as sources of truth to Freud. Now let's look specifically at his dreams. 
Freud understood sleep and dreams in a profoundly different way than prior cultures, such as ancient Greece. In his views, dreams continued to be a source of important knowledge, but knowledge of future events. For Freud, dreams provided self-knowledge by recapturing our recent and remote past. You ever hear of terminology to take you back into your childhood? Repressed memories and dreams, these all came out of Freudian uh, false science. Freud captured the educated public's attention with, with his ideas of the Oedipus, Oedipus complex, castration complex, primal scream, and family romance, all formulated from Freud's self-analysis of his own dreams and associations. Dreams and associated screen memories were, were disguised and distorted pathways to the recon, reconstruction of the formative events of our childhood, which could be revealed in clinical psychoanalysis. For Freud, dreams were the royal road to the understanding of the unconscious mind. He considered the interpretation of dreams as his masterwork. Well, you saw things we've all heard, the Oedipus complex. Freud had a, a love for his mother. He was an absolute sinner. But instead of calling it sin, Freudianism would mask sin and call it a behavior. And it would actually turn into what would be normative behavior as we see the world around us today. So Freud, his, his source, his primary source of truth were his dreams in his in his unconscious uh, state in a state of of his dream state so this this id was always in the unconscious and it was always looking to to uh to satisfy basic drives this was called the pleasure principle we've We've heard of books called that, movies called that, and it was all based on Freud and his dreams and his desire of self-satisfaction. Think for a second with me. Think of the general direction of the church today. Is it about Jesus or is it about self-satisfaction? Just think of that. Then there was the ego which seeks to, gratif to gratify the id in realistic ways, the reality principle. How can we do these illicit things that you dream of legally? And then there was the super ego, which, which was mostly at the top of the igloo. It was the voice of conscience and focus on how we ought to behave. See, they would look at the Bible and, and other sources of how we ought to behave, but in the background would be would be the the true self so it was it how we ought to behave a moral standard based not on the written standard of the word of god but on human standards and we could see how those standards have have regressed through the years so that's freud just a little bit a little bit there and i want to tie it all together next i want to look at carl jung carl jung uh, without going into his background or anything, he was most famous for his 12 archetypes that he used. 12 different types of personality that that people are. And later we'll, we'll see it, how it's uh, sometimes called the four temperaments, which are very commonly used today in the church still. The four the term archetypes has its origins in Greek, it means archon, which is original, and type, or patterns and mold. Actually, scriptures talks about the archon, which is Jesus Christ. He is the original uh, pattern for all things. So, 
Jung used the concept of archetype in his theory of the human psyche. He believed that universal mythic characters' archetypes reside within the collective unconscious. You hear that again? The collective unconscious of people the world over. Archetypes represent fundamental human motifs of our experience as we evolved. Consequently, they evoke deep emotions. There are different archetypes. Jung defined 12 primary types that symbolize basic human motivations. Each type has its own set of values, meanings, and personality traits. Also, the 12 types are divided in three sets of four, namely ego, which he took from Sigmund Freud, soul, and self. They line up with different names of Freud's view. Most people have several archetypes at play in their personality construct. However, one archetype tends to dominate the personality in general. So it would be helpful to know those archetypes. I just want to look through each of the, the, the three uh, types and their types that are underneath. The ego types. There's the innocent with the motto, free to be you and me. You're free to do anything you want. You don't want to be caught doing anything wrong. Number two is the orphan or the regular guy or girl. Number three is the hero. Number four, the caregiver. Then there are the soul types. Here's the explorer. Don't fence me in. The explorer, the rebel. You ever hear this? Rules are made to be broken. That's the rebel. Then there's the lover. And then the creator, the artistic one. Then the self types. The self types are the jester, the sage, the magician, and the ruler. Well, how many of us can fit in one of those categories? I think we all can fit in one or two of them, sure. What's wrong with that? I'm a type B or a type 2 or a type A, B, C, D. I'm one of nine of the Enneagram types. Another, another false personality test, the Enneagram. We can all fit into one of those. Now, I want to look at another one. I want to look at one this might, might really you know, tick some people off is the four temperaments. The four temperaments, then, and somebody in the 1970s and 80s that was probably the most prominent in Christian psychologies, and it was, he was, I don't think of him as a psychologist, was Tim LaHaye. Tim LaHaye put out several books on personality testings on the four temperaments. And so I have this little, little paper here. It's, it's an introduction of a Bible study from a church, and it says the following study has been prepared primarily as a result of reading two books by Mr. Tim LaHaye, Your Temperament, Discover Its Potential, and Spirit Control Temperament. These two books have much to offer in understanding and working with people, as well as better understanding of oneself. They can have a real value if used correctly to better unify God's people. We have made use of Mr. LaHaye's ideas and characterizations of the various types of people, along with his pictures to illustrate. We have greatly abbreviated the material for our use. We have also striven to identify the concepts as much as possible with scripture teaching. Here's a problem, and I'm going to look at that in a second. See, here is that right there, the, uh, this little introduction from one of many churches that would use LaHaye's material. And I, I, have, I, I like to mark up things right here. I'm going to look through these four temperaments. And 
I know we've probably all heard of them before, and they've been all used as as uh, earth, air, water, and fire. Here it's choleric, sanguine, uh, phlegmatic, and melancholy. They've all, they've all been used in that way. I've heard them used as as animal types: the lion, I think the lion, the bear, the elephant, and something else. I. I've since forgotten. I've gone to workshops on, on working with children in the past, and I now reject all of that stuff because of the philosophy behind it. So temperament, this is the words of Tim LaHaye, temperament provides both our strengths and weaknesses. God has given Christians the Holy Spirit who is able to improve our natural strengths and overcome our weaknesses as we cooperate with him. This article is a short overview of the four temperaments, which I must point out is not a perfect foolproof theory, though no theory of human behavior is. The, temp the temperaments sanguine, choleric, melancholy, and phlegmatic were first identified in Proverbs 30, 11 to 14. Now, let me... Let me put something in order here. Uh, the temperaments weren't first noted in Proverbs 30, verses 11 to 14. I don't have to go there. What LaHaye is doing and what many people do can even, even apply this to Calvinists with the doctrine of free will. They come at it with a philosophical statement rather than what's written in the scriptures. You take your philosophy and then you try to bend scriptures to that. So we have the, the, the first thing I put here wrong. It was first used by the ancient Egyptians and to use Proverbs is to deny the impeccability of God and his complete salvation, etc. So the the four temperaments are are all an outward expression of one self. I have news for you. Jeremiah seventeen nine says the heart is deceitful above all else. Who can know it? There's only one thing that can change a person. It's not growing and knowing your temperaments and trying to get along. There's only one thing, and that is salvation. It's regeneration. It's trusting the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation. But let's look at the let's look at these uh, uh, temperaments. Sanguine, sanguine is warm, buoyant, lively, and fun-loving. Oh. I love that one. I feel that way once in a while. Not right now, but I do feel that way. And then his choleric. It's hot, quick, active, practical, and strong-willed. By the way, they they listed Peter as the first one. I'd put Peter as as choleric. He always went against the Lord's will. He always was trying to correct Christ. So that's that's choleric. Then there's melancholy. That's the earth sign, and it's the dark temperament. Is analytical, self-sacrificing, gifted, per, uh, perfectionist, and has more creativity and imagination than the melancholy. Then the fourth one is phlegmatic. That's the water sign in astrology. Well balanced. Well, I'm phlegmatic sometimes. They're, they're, uh, they have conciliating effects on other. Then they're good in the field of education. You know what I say to all this? Throw it out. Throw it right out. What are what can we see about these things? Number one. They go against the Word of God. They purport to be for the Word of God, but really are against 
God's Word. Why is Christian psychology growing in popularity? As I mentioned, it's a philosophical argument which begins with man's ideas rather than a clear scriptural basis. See, we'd, be, we'd do much better to take the scriptures for what they say rather than coming up with our own, seat, own types of belief and try to twist the scripture to fit that way. And it meets a felt need, is immediate gratification. Uh, Freud and Jung uh, and many more, they, they believe this, but that by doing that, you could gratify self.